affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm James Max. You're with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Primetime, bringing you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. Tory veteran Mark Menzies' expenses scandal derails Rishi Sunak's good week as a new poll compounds his misery. Conservatives launch a fight back as the City of London slips from the party's grip. But is it too little too late? And also tonight, Prince Harry officially cuts ties with the UK. Plus, we'll be bringing you our nightly panel looking at the other stories making the headlines today with commentator Joanna Jaju and political correspondent at The Spectator, James Hill. This is Primetime. Very good evening to you. Now, you could, if you wanted to, feel a little bit sorry for Rishi Sunak. He spent the last couple of weeks hammering Labour, trying to use the argument over whether or not Angela Rayner wrongly escaped capital gains tax to finally dent Keir Starmer. He even had a good day at Prime Minister's Question Time yesterday, landing a few blows on his opposite number. And just at the point that seems to think things seem to be gathering a little bit of steam, a poll declares that he's as popular as... Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, an eye-watering scandal involving one of his MPs drops from the heavens. Yes, another one. The Times newspaper reporting that Tory veteran Mark Menzies made a late-night phone call saying he'd been locked up by bad people who were demanding thousands of pounds. It's incredible, you can't make it up, but thousands of pounds he eventually got from his office manager's personal account reimbursed with campaign funds, added to the thousands in cash from donors already spent on Menzies' medical expenses. And all, it's claimed, uh, known about by Conservative HQ for three months, which would, if true, mean that the MP suspension on charges that he strongly denies, by the way, is more for being found out than anything else. Now, for more on this, uh, I'm joined by the former Conservative advisor, Charlie Rowley. So, um, look, Charlie, let's uh, take a look at this. Uh, just as uh, Rishi Sunak perhaps was getting a little bit of momentum, uh, another scandal, it's kind of his own making. The Conservative Party knew about this three months ago. They did nothing. Well, um, uh, that's a question for the Conservative Party, but, you know, it has a chairman, it has a chief executive. Whether the Prime Minister was aware, I suspect he rather wasn't. And that's why I think the very first thing he said at the top of the show is, is right, you can start to feel just a little bit sorry for Rishi Sunak, where there is just scandal after scandal involving his backbench MPs, not his ministers, not his cabinet, not his government, uh, when this is a guy who, whatever you think about him, whatever you think about the policies, nobody faults Rishi Sunak for being a man of detail, of being someone incredibly hard-working, uh, and someone who who is a uh, very, very technical man, someone who is across the detail, uh, but he's waking up day after day to uh, these news stories, which is giving him probably and all of his team uh, a very bad headache. I mean, I do find it absolutely astonishing, though, that we've got a Conservative Party that is, um, you know, languishing in the polls, and yet um, they seem to find every goal to put you know, the football in their own end. It is absolutely astonishing that time after time uh, will they will make terrible errors. But I'm going to come back to you, Charlie, in a moment because I want to talk about this poll of, uh, just for a moment here because uh, voters are perhaps thinking, why on earth would we vote Conservative? Well, Delta Polls director Joe Twyman is down the line uh, with perhaps some of those answers. Let's just delve into that Ipsos poll if we can, Joe. Um, this is devastating for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? Uh, well, in a sense, no, because it simply backs up what all of the polls have been uh, have been showing. It's only as devastating as the one the day before, the day before that. It's the long-term trends that are most damaging to the Conservatives. Uh, Delta Poll, for instance, has uh, has Labour with a 20-point lead. That's good enough for more than a majority of 250. The Conservatives, however, have not been ahead in 
any published poll, whether it's by us or whether it's by others, since the 6th of December 2021. And Labour have had a double-digit lead since the 26th of September 2022. And so this is not a, a, an aberration. This is not a, a tweak or a spike. This is a long-term problem for the Conservatives. And every day that passes and that lead continues, it makes the challenge facing the Conservatives at the next general election only harder. Um, back to you, Charlie. Um, if you were still advising the Conservatives, what would you be advising them to do? Focus on stop the infighting or actually land some decent policies and deliver for people? Uh, well, certainly the former, um, stop the infighting and um, get behind the Prime Minister. I think as part of that poll, um, I'm right in saying, although Joe's no doubt correct me, uh, that 45% uh, still do not believe uh, that they are ready for a Labour government. And I think when that you ask the... That means 55% think they do. That would be monumental. You win an election with 38 or 39% of the vote. What kind of claptrap is that? Well, because when you get to the election... I know it's your birthday, which would be nice of you, <laughs> but that's just spin and rubbish. No, not at all, because when you get to the election, when the election is called, those polls will naturally narrow they always will do. they and when you as an advisor if you asked me if I was asking the, uh, the Conservative Party still I would be asking the public do you really believe uh, that Sir Keir Starmer who supported Jeremy Corbyn who wanted to get rid of the nuclear deterrent is really the party to look after our defense systems I think the answer is no do you really believe that Sir Keir Starmer who has uh, uh, thwarted every conservative effort to try and right. bolster our immigration policies Fine. do you think that the Labour voters... Party the party of immigration yeah, but the answer is no would... those are the questions Charlie. that I would be asking the government Fine. and the Conservative Party to put to the public I uh, that just sounds like noise to me. Because, frankly, <laughs> what I think a lot of people would be saying is they would be saying, you were given an opportunity by the electorate at the last election. Boris Johnson scored own goal after own goal and wrote his own departure. You then had a succession of leaders who were abominable. And then Rishi Sunak came along, might be a decent fellow, might be perfectly able and, and, and decent and put forward his five pledges, but he hasn't really delivered. Inflation we knew was going to come down regardless of who was Prime Minister, because if the Bank of England continued with their policy, none of us have got any money left. Jeremy Hunt has made all the wrong decisions in respect of tax. Uh, he hasn't stopped the boats. He hasn't cut the waiting lists. He hasn't delivered on growing the economy. It's an absolute mess. Well, um, you were articulating these five pledges there and uh, inflation has come down. Uh, there's no guarantee that inflation would have come down because, as you rightly indicated, the mistakes of the past of having other prime ministers that might have uh, tanked the economy, which they did. Uh, now, that is a mistake. You front up to that to say, look, the Conservative Party over the last 14 years has made mistakes, but under Rishi Sunak, you've got to judge him on the uh, 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 economy that he inherited under his predecessors and under the back of COVID, uh, and where there are still debts to pay. You've got to understand that he, as a Prime Minister, has done more than anyone else to try and tackle the stopping the boats crisis, to get immigration down, both legal and illegal. I don't illegal. care how much and he talks about it, he's delivered nothing. We've had more people come over on small boats than ever before. We're spending millions of pounds a day on housing these things. Anyway, Anyway, I could rant forever. However, I've got the benefit of a political panel who know far more than I do. Uh, Joanna Jaju and James Hill, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, let's come to you, Joanna, first. Welcome. Um, so, these um, accusations that have been made and the situation in which the Conservatives find themselves, it's almost as if, on a, on a daily basis and a weekly basis, they write the script themselves and they're writing themselves out of power, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. It seems as if there isn't a week that goes past where we don't have some sort of scandal. And the worst thing is that we're actually seeing the scandals equally from P uh, MPs that are within the Tory party, as well as people who are external, like donors and all the scandals and sillies that we see from, from that. And I don't think that, you know, leading up to a general election, really now is the time to kind of advertise and be on best behaviour. And the Tories are doing the absolute opposite. And it seems as if more and more things are coming out. And it's just been absolutely awful for them. It has been fairly terrible. James, um, you cover uh, things uh, from a maybe a gossipy standpoint sometimes for the spectator. Um, is this any worse than, for example, the Tory sleaze fest that existed perhaps from 92 until their eventual demise in 97? Well, this very much compares to it. And what's amazing is striking is the new unorthodox and original ways we're having this. I mean, some of those quotes you said at the top of the program trapped by some very bad people. I mean, you know, it sounds something out of a sort of, you know, badly written sort of Noel Coward farce or something. Um, I think, look, um, you know, this is the problem. It's a, a day ending in why. I mean, that means another day of problems for Rishi Sunak, another scandal. Um, and I think what's so striking is that, you know, I talk to both sides of Parliament and, you know, the Labour lot, a lot of them don't like each other, etc. There's equally a lot of backbiting tension, but they're all pulling together to get over 
the election line. The Tories, a lot of them, frankly, are exhausted and given up. And I think, you know, too many of them, I think, are in it for themselves right now and are not actually thinking about what the party is. And they're making silly mistakes. And I do agree with what Charlie says about, you know, how much can Rishi Sunak be held to be blamed for this? But unfortunately, voters are going to go to the polls and they're going to deliver a mandate, a, 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 a verdict, not so much on Rishi Sunak as on the party he leads. And I think after 14 years, it's a very difficult and tired party right now. And actually, Rishi Sunak should take a lot more responsibility for this because this is also a leadership issue. And when he first, you know, was in the hot seat and first going for leadership, he talked about, you know, accountability and he talked about discipline within the party. And we've actually seen more of the opposite, really. We, we've seen appalling taken... behaviour, but also we've sadly seen a chancellor who clearly didn't get the memo mm. on fixing the economy and has produced all the wrong results at all the wrong times and a whole load of other ministers who seem more interested in their position and their public profile than doing their jobs. Oh, I've just been rude to them. Uh, is, <laughs> Charlie, final word to you just before we let you go. Um, in terms of this, is there any way that the Conservatives can do anything to turn this around or is it just going to be a bloodbath at the next election in your view? No, no, I think there's um, uh, plenty it can do. It has to do more, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but it has to continue to articulate to the country what it is doing. So when it comes to things like migration, you know, those numbers are down. They're not down They're not to the down. biggest. Well, they are down. I mean, you, I They're mean, not uh, down. Well, I think. Sorry, like, what's in, not down in, 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 about the first three months, well, which were twenty six percent higher than the first three months last year? That's not down. Well, in total, in terms of, I think twenty twenty two, there was uh, fifty thousand people yes, that came to the country. Yes, we had COVID it, last year. You know, it, last year in twenty twenty three, it was down to thirty thousand. Those numbers are still too high. We've got to see what the end total is in twenty twenty four. Until you recognise there's a problem. We're only in April. In Until you recognise a problem and, within that party, isn't that and, the issue? And the, there la, is a, la, la, can't there, hear you. There is a night, no, no, but the, I, I'm, I'm just can't... explaining what the party, what the government should be doing, uh, I think, in the run for a general jobs. election, to say that those numbers are still high, but it is getting better. Okay. And they have to show their progress uh, and not just talk about it. I love how positive you are. And let us <laughs> once again wish you a happy birthday. Thank you so much for coming in on that. Much appreciated and being very robust with your views and staunch defence. More for my panel a little bit later on. Uh, and indeed, thanks uh, to Joe Twyman down the line as well. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Primetime. Now, next, the business minister launches a fight back as the City of London slips from her party's grip. But is it too late? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, James Max. Now, Kemi Bednog spoke to business chiefs in the City of London today, warning against a stifling of the free market if Labour were to win power in the impending general election. The Business and Trade Secretary said Labour would accelerate the amount of state intervention in financial services, which she said has become ever more widespread since the financial crash in 2008. Now, the so I would ask you to think of how different things might be with different philosophies, a different government, perhaps the Labour Chancellor inspired by Maoists, I can assure you this tide of ever more intervention will accelerate and become even stronger. Now, the Equalities Minister also warned about cultural issues getting in the way of growth and innovation, slamming green and diversity quotas. Baynock's speech comes after great efforts by Labour, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves to win round business leaders. With Labour so far ahead in the polls, is Blade Knox's speech a little bit too little, too late? Well, joining me in the studio is Deputy Political Editor of The Sun, Ryan Sabi. Ryan, um, look, as we look at how Kemi Badenoch can talk of sort of Labour accelerating financial regulations, when, frankly, the Conservatives have been in power through the majority of the years since the financial crash, they've applied more regulation, they've applied... Um, tax, if you speak to any banker and, and bank, they'll say the tax that has been imposed, the windfall taxes, they will say the regulation that has not been freed up, they will say that the open goal of post-Brexit you know, regulation has been you know, ruined. They will talk about the complexity of the tax system. Um, why should she even bother to turn up there? Because I can't imagine that they want to hear this nonsense. I think she's got to try and put a marker down. That's all she's been trying to do. Labour have been going hammer and tonger at, at the city to try and win round their support over the past, well, basically since uh, Keir Starmer became uh, leader of the Labour Party back in uh, April 2020, him and Rachel Reeves. I don't think there's a business leader in the city who they ha haven't met. So it seems like the Tories are almost, you know, they were seen as the party of business they're almost trying to play catch up on this um so it, it has been it's been very very difficult for the conservatives you speak to business and they say the engagement between particularly downing street and uh, the rest of government and that business community just hasn't been there but that's also that say for example kevin Bain, actually making a good point about you know has the um diversity and equality uh, pendulum swung too far that we've now started recruiting people on the basis of uh, either skin color age not age sex gender and all that sort of business as opposed to yes all those things are really important and you've got to break down glass ceilings and you've got to stop it just being a, a white male preserve you have to deal with that but um any kind of quota system which we've almost been putting in place is a nonsense. It doesn't achieve um, the results that you want. And ultimately, it means that you end up, in my view, making mistakes. But the Conservatives have been in power while that has happened. It's, the Conservatives have been in power whilst they've imposed um, ESG uh, restrictions and put in net zero um, uh, objectives, which they never consulted with business as to what was really achievable and doable and sensible and what was not doable and not sensible. I mean, and then this is too little too late, isn't it? So when you come to net zero, for example, one of the key things was trying to take the public with you. And when I remember when Theresa May launched this, um, you know, before you know, she signed up to the, um, she signed into legislation, the, the 2050 target, um, the, the Treasury were warning that this would cost a trillion pounds. And there was no sort of answer whether the public would actually come along with you. No. So I think on these diversity targets, Kemi Badenoch has basically said today these are, these are bad rules and we, we don't really, really need to bring them. This is in response to a financial regulator who are having a consultation on it, um, which, which um, that she says they should not go ahead with. It does strike me, though, as odd that they've almost seemed to... The Conservatives seem not to have listened. Um, in terms of who is good for business, and particularly small businesses up and down the country, uh, particularly looking at your readers in the sun, working, you know, whether it's white, van, man or woman, uh, whether it's a small business and enterprise or actually bigger business that perhaps 
many of us work for. Um, who are you rooting for? Have you yet to put your, your, your flag in the sand yet? I think it's all, all, to, it's all to play for. I think, you know, we, we will follow where, where our readers take us. And uh, I think you look at the, the polling of our, some of our readers um, over the recent months and, the, you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's even split anymore. There was a, a clear mark towards uh, uh, the Labour Party. Um, that's where they are. That's where, the, that's where the, the public are. And I suppose one of the other issues is that because the way that um, companies work, we all know that people at the top are going to get paid more than people at the bottom. We understand that. But when you have such a wide variance between... And I think I seem to remember when I first started work, it might have been 10, 12, 15 times between uh, the lowest paid employee and perhaps the chief exec, who is probably the highest paid employee. Um, now it's, it's hundreds of times. We've, we've got this huge wide divide. And that's also because it's the chief executive's job to keep down the wage bill. And then it's the uh, executive boards to get the chief executive who's going to provide the most returns for shareholders. Um, that seems to me to be a system that is, is really divisive within the workplace. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the reasons why um, you, you'll have those those incidents in big business, but also, you know, for the small businessman, you have to try and create the right environment. So you have to try and make sure that the business rates, uh, you know, you have to make sure the high streets are thriving, actually make people actually yeah. want to go to high streets. Because people, for example, love the pub. Yeah. And your readers will love the pub, I love the pub. Being a publican is a really difficult thing at the moment. Why? Because of the legislation. Why? Because of the cost. Why? Because they haven't reformed business rates. They've been told for 15 years, 20 years, reform business rates. They're not effective. They've allowed businesses to come along and undermine their, you know, their bread and butter of support. Go back to, you know, I always take the view, what would Margaret say? And if... Margaret would have said, no, small businesses must thrive and flourish. Big businesses must uh, take responsibility for what they do, but also pay their staff well and reward their investors for, you know, sticking with them. And we must free them of regulation and let the free market do its job. And we wouldn't have had this mess. I mean, I, she might have been responsible for privatising um, the water companies, but we wouldn't have this mess of, you know, companies simply misbehaving and a regulator not being effective. She would have got her handbag out and sorted them out. Yeah, I think you just have to try and cut back as much red tape as there is, um, just try and get the you know people actually getting into in, into those particularly the pubs for example because it's just so difficult you know it and, it, and it's expensive for people to go out there so you, you know people only go they're, they're voting with their feet and they're actually going to spend their money when they want where they, where they want to spend and it have that chancellor i mean let me bring uh, our prime time panel into this um joining me in the studio of course commentator joanna jaju and political correspondent and the spectator james hill thank you both uh, for staying with us now let me bring you in i was just about to have another rant james and i was just <laughs> about to you know talk about the yeah. fact that pubs you try and buy a pint in central London. Is it £4.50, £5? And in some cases, I think the most expensive pint in London is up to £8 for a pint of beer, lager, whatever it may be. Outside of London, yeah, you can go to a Spoons and you might find it at £2.80 or £3 or whatever it may be. And, but very often it's £4 across the board. That's a lot of money for people to stump up for a pint. And yet, part of the reason it's so high and expensive is because of business rates. Absolutely, and I think this is the whole issue we're talking about here. I actually think the Conservative government on banks has actually got a decent record we could talk about about you know, lifting things like the banker's bonus cap, the Edinburgh reforms, for instance, the speech that the Chancellor did last year in his May's lecture. But what I think is so striking is that when we talk about things like cost of living, for instance, and the way in which the city's structured, you're right. And obviously, the pub, for instance, are closing earlier thanks to lack of planning laws because the government hasn't developed a decent planning system. And when we get things like taxation, for instance, and taxation deterring talent from coming to the city, this is what we mean about the whole lack of you know, an overall approach and the government, served to government's issues in the past 14 years. So I think on the city, they've got a decent record. And Labour's actually been playing catch up on some of this stuff. But I think now it's much more about a values judgment. And I think Right now, I think, as Ryan was saying, the way in which Labour has sort of gone about courting the city, you know, I think Rachel Reese has done dozens of these sort of smoked salmon breakfasts with bankers, etc. That I think that the bankers, even the sort of hardcore capitalists in the city of London, are like everyone else right now, and they're all voting Labour. Why, why is it, Jonah, that um, Rachel Reeves can work in the Bank of England in a uh, department that hasn't got a single forecast right, and for some reason people seem to think that she knows what she's talking about and be trusted? Uh, do you think that uh, Rachel Reeves is trusted by uh, city and big business? Absolutely, I think she's trusted. And I think that, especially after Liz Truss, um, when it comes to the bankers, I don't think that the um, Conservative Party can ever claw back that respect that they've lost. So it doesn't really ever. matter. That's a, that's a, that's a step. OK, maybe it? in the next 10 years. But people still remember, and I think people are still angry. And clearly, um, judging by the way that the market's reacted, they have a very clear opinion on the Conservative Party. And they're basically, I guess, in a way, voted with but their feet. do you think, different to 97, if and when they get into power, 
the pressures will be very quickly upon them because mm -hmm. people are not voting for Labour at this stage, in my view. A lot of listeners, to certainly to my shows, they call in and say, we're exasperated. We're exasperated with the Conservatives because they need to change. Mm -hmm. We're not voting for Labour because we think they're going to be any better. Well, I think that it's a bit of both. You know, some people are, you know, just kind of voting more so as um, against the Conservatives more than um, for Labour. But I also think that people just are desperate for this change. And especially for somebody like me, who's um, in the North, you've got people like Angela Rayner, who I know that obviously has been in the hot seat recently. But actually, well, two I, hours is Rayner. I, I attended. Two hours uh, is Rayner. I attended trust it. her. <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. You trust her? I do. I do you trust see, her. You see, but this is and, and the Northerner, They're going to be the same. Would, no, they but, haven't no, learned a thing. We're talking about... The same. We obviously are talking about the bankers in London, but also when it comes to small businesses in particular, and I have a small business in the North, it is very important to us that Labour pay attention. And I went to an event called Convention of the North. Angela Rayner did a speech and she gave, had she a did. great response. And I think I'm that sure all did. of this, because we've seen what the Conservatives have done when it comes to um, the North and when it comes to levelling up, and it's been we saw, next to nothing. But it's fair to say, though, James, yeah. you know, when we talk about what Labour last did, we had all this stuff about how all these other things and how they tried to shift the blame. Labour contributed to the financial crash. Labour also contributed to the part privatisation of the NHS and the legacy 30-year PFI projects in the NHS, which are costing us today a fortune. I completely agree, and I think that, you know, you put your finger on it there, which is that Rachel Reeves, I think the biggest criticism fear I have about her as Chancellor will be that there'll be a lack of political imagination and challenging the failed orthodoxy of the past 30 years in many of these respects. And if she just goes on the Bank of England, we'll have some of the same issues we've had for the past 30 we, years. We will indeed. Uh, for now, for my panel, you'll be back later. Ryan Saving, Deputy uh, Political Editor at The Sun. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us now. Next tonight, oh, it's royal stuff. Prince Harry, oh, he's been out of the news for five minutes, so he's back in again because he's officially changed his country of residence from the UK to the United States of America. Yee-haw. And in an apparent snub, he backdated his new status to the exact day where he and Meghan were asked to vacate Frogmore Cottage by King Charles. Now, the change of address was filed this week for his sustainable tourism organisation, Travelist. I smile just because of the amount of private jets he used, but anyway, uh, although the date of change is listed as June the 29th last year, not when the Duke and Duchess emigrated in early 2020. Meanwhile, Prince William returned to public duties today for the first time since Kate's cancer diagnosis with a visit to a food surplus redistribution charity in Surrey. Well, joining me to discuss this is the Royal Commentator, Kinsey Schofield. So, um, Kinsey, thank you so much for joining us on Primetime. Should we be surprised that Harry is registered uh, as a resident of the US? Probably for tax purposes, isn't it? Well, I do agree with other commentators that the date is significant. This is, you know, another Prince Harry hissy fit because if Prince Harry wanted to be a citizen of the United States, he could certainly go through the proper channels. Um, but I don't think he wants to. I think he wants, you know, according to the Immigration and, and Nationalization Act, if he decides to become a U.S. citizen, he will be forced to renounce any title or order of nobility he holds before he acquires that American citizenship. And I don't think that's something he's willing to give up. I think that clearly him and his wife have been merching that uh, since they moved to the United States. Remember when CNN's Anderson Cooper asked him, why not renounce your titles as Duke and Duchess? Harry, it, it wasn't necessarily what he said. He said, and what difference would that make? Um, the difference is that it's the law. It was how defiantly he replied to that statement. Uh, he told Good Morning America in February that he considered becoming a U.S. citizen, but it wasn't a high priority. So while it is a nice change of address on, uh, you know, documentation, the reality is he still wants to have that title and, and wants to be considered the, the Duke of Sussex, the, the um, you know, the, the Prince of America is the reality of it all. Okay, so let's, let's just talk about that because th there is, in my view, a slightly entitled view that comes across when Harry talks about either the title almost saying, well, I was born with it, so I should keep it. But then, of course, the lack of respect of it, that if one goes back to the words of the late Queen, that it was reported that she said, well, you can't be half in, half out, you've got to pick. Because the thing is that if you're in that institution, we all know that you get huge benefits from it in terms of the title that you can use, the benefits that you get, um, the uh, situations and the things that you get invited to and the people that you will meet. Well, if you're out of it, then you really shouldn't have any benefit from it. 
And uh, as a result of that, it's kind of duplicitous, is it not, of Harry to continue to keep that uh, title in order to monetize the situation for him and his wife. Well, another argument I would make is that he's trying to get involved in American politics, whether he is, uh, you know, campaigning for um, the education of deep fakes throughout this this upcoming election, whether he was sitting down during the Times 100 special on ABC with Meghan Markle and without blatantly endorsing Joe Biden, kind of endorsing Joe Biden um, during the last election. So, uh, yeah, it, his he does his campaign to change the way we communicate on social media while calling our first amendment bonkers um, as an american i struggle with harry wanting to keep the title wanting to keep um you know uh, wanting to us to refer to him in this manner and talking down to us at, like he's an authority on anything um but refusing to renounce his title to become an actual citizen of the united states but Kinsey, isn't that part of the problem that, for example, you talk about him talking down to us uh, because maybe we don't understand, maybe, you know, he has an entitled position. Fine. Empowering travellers to make more sustainable choices. So that's the words on the Travelist website. And as soon as you go into the detail, they talk about the various choices, the various aviation issues. Here is somebody who travels a lot. Here is somebody who insists on having security details who travel in a lot of cars. Here is somebody who lives in a parallel universe that says to us, you must be more careful of your travel solutions because of what it does to our planet. Meanwhile, if I want to go to uh, go and see my dad in, in the UK, if I want to go to a pop concert, if I want to do this, if I want to do that, I'm going to go on a private jet and I'm going to travel my way. Uh, and he's put his name to this thing. He is... It's just so hypocritical, isn't it? It's so hypocritical. And, you know, I think he would argue safety for why... He, I think I've heard him argue safety for why he takes private jets. And I can tell you, as somebody that flies out of the same airport that Prince Harry does, I get a full-body cavity search, OK? And nobody buys me dinner for me to get through the security line. It is the safest place to be, Prince Harry. You can go sit with the the, the nobodies. The, the You know, you can sit with the regular people on any sort of plane. So I completely agree with you when it comes to travelists. It, it's ridiculous when he jumps on any private jet offered to him. I mean, don't get me wrong, given half an opportunity, if I were, I would jump on a private jet, but then I wouldn't necessarily call for you or others not to if you were given the opportunity. Kenzie Schofield, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your views on Harry and the latest twists and turns there. Now, next on Primetime, Downing Street declares Iran must never be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon as the world waits for Israel to respond to the weekend's attack. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Some breaking news for you. Peter Murrell, the husband of Nicola Sturgeon and former SNP chief executive, is understood to have been charged in connection with embezzlement of funds from the SNP following a Police Scotland investigation into the party's finances. Uh, we'll be covering that and bring you some more details as soon as we have it. Now, uh, to another story that um, Downing Street has warned that Iran must never be allowed to develop a nuclear weapon as Lord Cameron pushes his fellow G7 foreign ministers for collective action after the Islamic Republic launched more than 300 missiles and drones at Israel on Saturday. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps said that it would be naive not to expect a response from Israel after it was targeted by Iranian missiles and drones. But he joined the Foreign Secretary in warning against escalation after Lord Cameron visited Jerusalem en route to the G7 talks. Well, joining me now in the studio is military analyst Sean Bell. Sean, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. So what kind of response do you think we're going to see from Israel? Uh, because we've had the pleas from world leaders... Um, sort of falling on deaf ears. But then on the other hand, uh, put it in our situation, if 300 rockets and munitions had been fired at the UK, we would just say, oh, let's not escalate this. We'd respond, wouldn't we? We would, but I think let's tackle that last bit first. Um, it, uh, this current iteration of the conflict between uh, Israel and Iran wasn't started on that fateful night, Saturday night. It was started on the 1st of April when um, Israel attacked the consulate, killing 13 people, including several Iranian generals. That was considered a sovereign territory, and as a result, Iran vowed retaliation for that event. So but you're the... saying that the 1st of April is kind of the kickoff, but that wasn't the kickoff, was it? Because what Israel would argue is that they would say that um, Iran's proxies have been fighting a war against them for many years. That's why I qualified it by saying the latest iteration of right. conflicts. Um, and be because there are something like a, a 18 different Iranian generals that have been killed over the years in Syria, which no action has been taken. On this particular occasion, even though the action was taken in Syria, it was in the it, consulate in Damascus, that was something that the Ayatollah specifically said there will be a retaliation. Okay. Therefore, the 331 uh, missiles came across. But trying to then get to your the root of the question, I think uh, Israel's really got three options. It does nothing, which seems untenable in the situation, even though a lot of leaders, the United Nations have been meeting today to try to provide a load of sanctions on Iran to try and take away, undermine the, 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 um, the Israelis' demand, okay. uh, d desire. So they've got, or they could go hard and heavy. They could launch a similar number of rockets back, but they are probably going to be more successful in striking their targets, but that would undoubtedly set off a war. And therefore, what is it middle ground where there's a measured response, probably against military targets, probably not in population centres, probably relatively surgical. That's the, what they're calling the Goldilocks solution. Not too hot, not too cold, about warm in the middle. And that seems to be, despite the fact that West doesn't want that to happen, I suspect that's where Israel will fall. Let's talk a little bit about the Iranian nuclear programme and the capabilities there. How far off are they in, in terms of being able to have that capability? I mean, we know that, for example, they've got ballistic missiles. We've now seen them. We know they've got drones. We've seen those. They may not be particularly effective, but they have them. 
Right, first of all, I'm no nuclear expert, but the um, point about um, nuclear weapons is all about how enriched the uranium is. Now, the programme that Iran has, they claim they've no interest in uh, developing nuclear weapons. I, I'd probably be as cynical as anybody about whether that's actually true or not. Most um, experts believe they could be actually weeks away from developing a programme should they decide to do that. But there would be indicators for all sorts of reasons about should they decide to do that. The, the problem that Iran had when it was considering its response is it does not want to give Israel or America a, a licence, an excuse to come after that nuclear programme. Now, most of it's well buried, be very difficult to target, but that could be something that I Israel targets because, ultimately, it's not if, it's when Iran gets a nuclear weapon. That will be the ultimate deterrent from any further attacks by Israel or the US. Just finally, uh, do you think that it's likely that Netanyahu will respond before Saturday? No. Short answer. Part of it, I think there's a bit of thinking time going on. There's United Nations going on. There's lots of uh, considerations about the sorts of targets. I think that would be a bit of a rush, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but my gut is that that wouldn't happen that quickly. Um, well, there we go. Military analyst Sean Bell, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us now. Uh, let's uh, turn our attention now, though, to um, something else. Uh, the cruise industry. It's expected to be worth £7.4 billion pounds globally. Now, that's a figure that's projected to triple within the next decade. So Richard Branson, well, as we know, he's uh, leader of the Virgin Group. It's one of the latest companies to enter the market with an adult-only offering. After pulling out of space travel late last year, the 73-year-old Branson is hoping that holidays at sea will steady the ship. Oliver Whitfield of Nierchik went to interview the CEO of Virgin Voyages uh, on an open-top bus decked out like one of their cruise liners. No, Mal, thanks so much for speaking with us. Virgin Voyages out on a mission to make cruising cool again then? No, people, have, people love these ships. They love this epic experience we've created. You know, Richard challenged us to create the kind of voyage that he'd be proud to go on, and I feel very proud that we managed to do that. These ships are award-winning ships. We've won all the major consumer awards last year. We rated, just in the UK in particular, rated best premium cruise line. Uh, one of the big things about us is we have a kid-free experience on board. It allows us to create a very elevated and sophisticated, yet relaxed environment on board, all with that unmistakable virgin style and service. People love the food on board. They love the service. And most importantly, they love the value for money that we offer, particularly for the UK public, it's very important. The UK has a huge holiday market. We love to go on holiday, but when it comes to going on a cruise, it's highly divisive. People my age say they don't want to be stuck on board. They don't want to have to join a line for a buffet. So how do you convince those people to get on board one of your ships? You know, this is one of the fascinating things about Virgin Voyages. We have so many people that try our ships that have never been on ships before, and they just love it because we've taken all the best parts of a cruise that people love, like going to all these destinations, staying late, staying overnight. And then we took all the things that we found that people didn't quite like, like buffets, like big dining halls, and we eliminated them. So on our ships, for example, we don't have any buffets. We don't have any big dining halls. People, when they think of cruise ships, they think of mass. They think of large 2,000-person dining halls. The biggest restaurant on board is about 200 seats. Everything is made to order food, like going out to dinner in London. And that's what people love about the ships, and the food in particular people love because everything is made to order. And the brilliant thing about that is Classic Virgin, we're able to lower the waste and reinvest that back in quality and create really high quality food on board. The other thing that people love about our ships is that there's a lot of outdoor workout areas. We've taken all the things that traditionally people think about, like water slides and all these other mass environment spaces, made a very elevated and cool space on the board. And you'd be surprised at how many people that say they're non-cruisers get on a Virgin Voyage and they decide they become cruisers after that. You launched in 2021, a difficult time for many in the travel sector. How has that recovery been from the pandemic? Yeah, look, travel generally was taking a huge hit during the pandemic. Um, you know, cruise lines in particular took a very big hit. We were shut down for a long period of time. Thankfully, we don't talk as much about the pandemic as much anymore. But we've seen such a resurgence in travel generally across airlines and hotels and now cruise lines. This, our industry in particular is fully recovered now, which is great to see. People, people want to travel. They want experiences. One of the things we've seen in particular is people, you know, the consumption on experiences is really going up. So people looking for these unique experiences to go explore. With us in particular, they can go into the Med, sail out of Barcelona, sail out of Athens and experience something that they've never experienced before. And it's one of the reasons it's driving a lot of our success. Last year, you launched cruises in 
the Australian market, but you've had to cancel that this year because of the after effects of the terrorist attack in Israel. Yeah, it's looking, our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone affected by this conflict in the region, right? And we hope that obviously things can settle down very some soon. But, but for us, at the end of the day, it's what our sailors are looking for. And our sailors love being in port, they love being in the destinations. And so that's why we made those adjustments. Recent reports in the past week have shown that Sir Richard Branson has lost billions of pounds because of failed investments in Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit. You've got this huge promotion at the moment for Virgin Voyages. Is it the case that you're actually swapping spaceships for cruise ships now? Oh, no, not at all. Look, at the end of the day, we think about it, what Virgin's about is creating really great experiences for people. Um, yes, the pandemic is a really tough time for us because we're very heavily exposed to travel, but the great thing is travel is bouncing back now, right? And the consumer is looking to get out there, looking to travel, looking to have, looking for experiences nowadays, right? And Virgin Voyage is perfectly fit to fit on that trend. I'd say the other thing that people are looking for these days, generally, is people want quality experiences. We don't want a lot of the stuffy formality that's typically come with old school luxury and that's where Virgin plays a perfect angle and so in cruising in particular we feel very very bullish about what we're doing uh, we know it's right on trend for what people are looking for but across the Virgin group generally you're seeing such a rebound in travel that you're going to see the Virgin group really bounce back there we go yeah, that's your holiday sorted apparently anyway next on prime time I'm going to be joined by the prime time panel we're going to be going over some of the other top stories from the day including a row over who gets to be part of world football but just before we get uh, to that break talk is going digital and here's how you could watch listen and get involved from monday the 29th of april very good morning to you thanks for joining us the home of big opinions oh don't start me on that straight talking there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something and no nonsense so don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars is going digital such as the smoke and mirrors here of politics. Make sure you're ready. But the government has got to be more flexible. From the end of April, listen to talk on radio via DAB or your smart speaker. Or watch live on YouTube on your connected TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some of the other big stories of the day. Joining back in the studio, our commentator, Joanne Chaju, and political correspondent at The Spectator, James Hill. Now, talks on throwing Israel out of the World uh, Football Championships and Cups over its response to the October the 7th Hamas terrorist attacks are to be held at FIFA's annual conference next month. The Palestine Football Association submitted a proposal for inclusion to address what it branded uh, as actions that represented an existential threat tantamount to genocide. The proposal cited FIFA's decision to throw Russia out of world football following its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, I, I find this absolutely horrifying. Um, Joanna, uh, should Israel be excluded from uh, world football by FIFA? Well, let me start by saying that I think that Israel is completely different from Russia. I think that that was very clear cut. Obviously, Israel, um, everything's been going on after the um, October 7th attacks. However, we also have to take into account the, the level of proportionality when it comes to Israel's response. And it's not just, you know, the football associations that are condemning them. Obviously, you've had the case when it comes to South Africa as well. And all of these conversations, you know, bubble up into something that does actually make this a viable case. Yes, and for this to actually... football the play where you judge proportionality. And there's a difference between invading somebody's country and uh, providing a response. Now, there are many people around the planet and the world who will say that Israel's response is entirely justified. There will be some who don't. Um, and inevitably, when you have pictures of any individual, I don't care who they are or how old they are or where they come from, mm -hmm. any kind of suffering is always going to pull at the heartstrings and nobody wants to see any human suffering of an individual. Um, but then, of course... What happened on October the 7th was so heinous, so appalling, so mm. devastating. And we're dealing with 15 years of kind of built-up response where we weren't reporting on the munitions and the, and the missiles that were being hoofed into Israel on a daily basis. Mm. So is, it, I guess my question is, is somewhere like FIFA the mm. place where these kind of political tit-for-tats should be held, whereas I thought sport was supposed to be inclusive and bring people together? Well, I think so to an extent. Obviously, they're talking about um, particular footballers that have been um, killed um, through this conflict. So would it you, has would actually Would you vote over... for or against them? Um, I think I would vote for. I think that there has to be a certain level of accountability what, when it comes to... You would to... vote for Israel to be excluded? I, I think I would, yeah. I think mm. I would vote for Israel to be excluded at oh, this James stage. Oh, James is bristling. Pending. James. <laughs> I think that there has to be a level of accountability. No, oh. I, I think I voted against, and I think that uh, the reason why partly I always think is why not play each other on the pitch. And I remember when North Korea sent its players to the Football World Cup of 2010 and, you know, la creme de la creme of Pyongyang got thrashed 7-0 by Portugal. So I always think, you know, let these things play out on the sporting pitch. And I also think it's a pretty dangerous precedent to have set with Russia. And I didn't like it particularly when in Wimbledon they banned Russian players from playing at that for just on the basis of the nationality. Yeah. But it's also about the soft power as well. I know that you were saying that football has nothing to do with it, but things like this do actually have an impact. And I think that, you know, it's gone further now than, you know, you being Sorry, either, you're on the side of Palestine. Sorry, you're going to call for Israel to be removed out of the Eurovision Song Contest then? I mean, potentially. I think that, you know, something no, has to be done no, in terms of no. protest. Then and if it is actually rule. No, but if it is actually affecting people with it, they feel that they have a responsibility for saying that, you know, football pitches have been bombed, saying that certain footballers have been killed, obviously but that makes a case for some of the things that Israel I, has been I understand of. that. But if that attack had been perpetrated in Britain, mm -hmm. if that attack on October the 7th had taken place on our shores, mm -hmm. do you think we would have been talking about proportionality. Uh, we know. should be. 
I think that we should be, and I would be very disappointed if we weren't talking about um, proportionality, because as mm -hmm. a respected Western, well, look, apparently what, look progressive what we did after nine eleven, and that wasn't even wasn't, our fight. But it wasn't. I mean, thirty. We didn't also just kill thirty thousand people, over thirty thousand people. How many people died after, in, in a in a in no? But Iraq within in that, that particular say, um, uh, space of time, oh, I think you're on dodgy more than there. half of those being children. I think that obviously this isn't just no, something. No, this that's is the narrative that you. No, this but is just the narrative that you walked into. Just something that's you know my opinion that it's oh I'm just pro-Palestinian or something like that. This is something that a case has been put toward um, in front of the ICJ, and obviously it's also been said that there's a plausible case. That's not to say that it's definite that Israel is, but I think I that understand, it's also... but I, I think there will be a lot of people who disagree. Anyway, next, a GP is fighting to save her medical career after she was jailed uh, for taking part in a Just Stop oil protest. She's defended her actions by claiming that uh, they were part of a doctor's fundamental duties to protect health and life. I mean, my view is uh, sling all these protesters in jail, isn't it, James? I mean, I'm sick and tired of them. They break the law, they break the rules, they cause us trouble. Uh, they don't really care about the cost that they're causing to the environment. It's just like, OK, if you think that carefully about it, go and get yourself elected. Well, I have a degree of sympathy with this person in the sense of, oh. you know, I feel, I, feel, well, I feel a bit bad for her, but I also think, frankly, you can't break the law and be a doctor, and we have those rules in place for a reason. So, yeah, I mean, there's an irritation, and I find it this creeping sense of different professions where they go, oh, I have a right to do X or I'm a lawyer, so I can't practice that. And I think you really start to question and doubt the pillars on which our society is based, including if you're a GP, don't break the law. Joanna, in agreement? Uh, no, actually, I think that, you know, um, she shouldn't be struck off uh, because of this protest. Her claim is that obviously she's doing it also as a responsibility for people's health. Um, we know that, um, you know, this particular topic does actually affect people's health, even when it comes to things like respiratory and... Uh, are you looking at me as if You're in a it studio is which is true. powered by electricity. It you, is you, true. Do you drive a car? No, I don't. Do you go on holiday? Yes. Right. So you go on a plane? Yes. Right, you destroy the environment. <laughs> you killed all the polar bears. Right, finally, uh, let's just have a quick word about this. Uh, everything's going up, but Britain's most expensive cup of coffee might just surprise you. A single cup of coffee is on sale. This is insane. At a cafe in London's Mayfair... £265 uh, made from uh, a Jap uh, it's a Japanese variety of Arabica beans, apparently. Uh, and you can try the coffee as an espresso, a macchiato, a flat white, Americano, cappuccino or latte. Quite frankly, if you're going to be spending that much money, in a word, <laughs> I mean, if you're spending that much money, you've got too much money and probably you should put in, be put in jail because you, you're stupid. Yeah, this is absolutely ridiculous. It reminds me of um, the, the restaurant, you know, the Salt Bay person yeah. that was charging quid so for much no. for a steak. The only people who's going to be queued up for this are journalists putting it on expenses. So really? we tried it for a feature. Yeah, absolutely, 265 quid. Have you tried it for a feature? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I bet you are. I, I don't even like paying for overpriced Starbucks. Never then there, there we go. We must leave it there on that bombshell. Thank you very much indeed to my panel and indeed to all my guests throughout the show. Right, that's all we've got time for tonight. I'm going to be back for prime time on Monday. Thanks for watching. Now, you can also catch me on Early Breakfast. That's tomorrow at five. Mind you, the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. That's next. Good night. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such is the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. The home of big opinions. Oh, don't start me on that. Straight talking. There's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. And no nonsense. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Is going digital. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Make sure you're ready. But the government has got to be more flexible. From the end of April, listen to talk on radio via DAB or on your smart speaker. Or watch live on YouTube on your connected TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. 